All right, slash X slash. I don't really trust therapists, and my dad won't talk to me about it. I would have gone on ignoring this, too, if I hadn't started having the nightmares again. I need to get this off my chest, and maybe find some closure. I'm not going to green text everything, but a lot of it will be. I'm pre-typing this in notepad, and just trying to stay cohesive. I live in the high desert of Oregon, and I won't go into any more specifics, for obvious reasons. There's three characters to this story, me, my dad, and a friend from soccer, Nick. I'll include some pics as they become relevant of similar places in the Badlands, from Google. I don't have any original pictures of this as back then my phone was a piece of shit just for texting and calls and I wasn't into photography, so I never got a camera. Be me. Greater than 15, fall of 2012. Live in a fairly rural part of town, like to be outside, and as I'm homeschooled, dad tries to get me into extracurricular sports. I make it onto a soccer team that's not really an official team, but it's something to do and I don't get fat, dad is happy, etc. Make a friend, great forward, his name is Nick, I'm not changing his name because Nick is a fucking common name and I'm bad at making new ones, there's somewhere around 80 Nick people in that town anyways. Towards the cooler season, we three decide to go camping, dad's happy because it's a guy's trip and that I have a friend. Nick is happy because he doesn't go that often, I'm happy because I love the desert. Take my family's two dogs, German Shepherds, and stuff for a two-day trip. Dad has three guns, 2.22 pistols and a .22 rifle. The pistols are for emergency home slash car defense. The rifle is for small games sometimes. They're not big guns, but we've never really needed them. Head out to the Badlands. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Pacific Northwest, or Oregon. It is mostly rainy, wet, green, mossy, lush, you name it. However, smack in the lower half of Oregon, there's the Badlands Wilderness. The Badlands is fucking intense. Hot as hell in the day, cold as balls at night, and it never really changes by season, it just gets colder or hotter. I won't get into the dangerous desert electrical storms. It's full of brush, rock, and thousands of acres of endless sand and short scrub trees, and deadwood. It's like a graveyard, most times, because of all the bones and shit out there. I love it still, even after this, but it's a really, really harsh place to the unprepared. We have hikers die out there yearly just from weather. A decent amount of it is hiking trails, owned land, etc. But the vast, vast majority of it is undeveloped wasteland. We camp in the wasteland. Drive to a trailhead, walk in a few miles, and then weave off. Dad and I have walked our dogs out here numerous times. We know where we are and where we're going, and there's more landmarks in the way of stones and shit. Dogs are off lead, just doing dog things. Nick, Dad, and I all talking, generally just being dudes, etc. Make it a good five or six miles off the trail before dark. It's a bit dusky, beautiful sunset, all that shit. Set up in between some rocks, I would have pictures, but this was years and years ago. They've been since lost and my phone was dog's hit at that time anyways. No fire because law-abiding citizens got some cook stoves and shit though, pock it up outside the tent, roast some hot dogs and BS like that over the tiniest flame. It's absurd but fun and we're all enjoying it. Dogs get a bit weird as the evening goes on. These are not couch potato ass dogs. One of them was a shut time competitor, Reed, trained guard slash sport dog. The other was an adopted adult that was generally just a good boy. Commence enjoyment anyways, dogs eventually settle down, but on alert, period low growls, we figure they're just new to this particular area, or maybe there's a scavenger animal. The night passes without any issue, get up next morning, eat some shitty camp breakfast that we all love because my outdoors. Dad takes a nap, keeps the .22 pistols but gives Nick and I the .22 rifle, I'm responsible enough to handle it and Nick's not a total retard. Maybe we plink some rabbits or some shit, we think, but really we're just taking pot shots at dead trees and rock formations like retards, squeezing off shots and playing around with the scope. 
Neither of us are a bad shot, and we're just out exploring and being 15 and 16 year olds, basically. We have compasses and packs, and like I said, neither of us are full potato. I'll cut the green text for a bit more of a description for this place. It's about a mile north of the Broken Rock Formation where we were camped, across some flat nothingness. It's a small grove-esque clusterfuck of rock chunks and dead trees, maybe a living juniper or two. Not big, not thick, more spread out than lush. Enough cluster to be shady and notably a bit of an oasis from the waste. Nick and I have no fucking idea what's in there, if anything. Could be some coyotes, man, hardcore as hell. We rambo our asses up there, crouching like it's Skyrim, slowly creeping in. I've got the rifle drawn and around chambered. It's the desert, though, and we're still being loud enough that no small game would stick around for us anyways. It's quiet, and there's no animals in sight. As we get into the cop slash rock entry cluster, it darkens up a bit and gives a really neat aesthetic to the whole deal. We stop creeping like retards and stand up, and check out the whole area, probably a solid four or five hundred square feet of loosely collected rock spires slash chunks, logs, dead trees, and a couple living trees. Some of the logs and branches fell against a bent tree and some stone like a little natural hut slash thicket slash whatever. There's a bunch of bones and collected to try this inside, nothing artificial, but there's some stiff, long dead and dried animal hide scraps, the sand is dark, just general appearances of being a den of sorts. Nick's interested and I'm not too phased as this isn't my first time outdoors nor in the badlands, you get piles of animal bones pretty often if you're looking several miles out, coyotes just gnaw the fuck out anything dead and leave them in piles. Then smells like a fucking garbage heap mixed with sulfur, absolutely atrocious, we pfo from that noise after the smell hits us. Continue to inspect the grove, and from now on in the story I'm calling it the grove. There's a climbable tree, technically most of them are, but this one's the most sturdy looking. The problem with Badlands trees is that they're incredibly fragile and breakable, given that even when they're alive, they're very dry. Finding one that my ass can get up without snapping is difficult, as my height and weight are not compatible for these types of things. Drop myself up about 12 feet or so, take a look with the scope, pretty cool. Drop down, mix back to looking at the den. We should come back later and see if its owner is home. Technically even if this owner was home, it wouldn't have been legal to kill it unless this was Monty Python's death rabbit, as we didn't have any tags or licenses for coyote or otherwise. Still think it'd be cool to snag a look at something in its home, Nick's never seen this and though I've seen, and shot, many coyotes, I've never seen one at home. We agree to do so, but with the dogs just in case, coyotes are cowards but this might be a group hideout and we don't want to get nipped before we gun them down for self-defense if necessary. Continue fucking around the rest of the day, go back to find that dad has walked the dogs and come back, small cook stove fire going. The minute we walk into the camp though, the dogs get very, very upset with us. They sniff us gingerly, and then back away, growling, doing that leaning head tilt like they don't understand. Don't let us near them for a while, they always keep a few feet away and then return to being alert. We tell dad what we found about a mile up and he tells us about his walk. He agrees to come with us and bring the dogs, if only because he wants to see it too. Evening again, not quite dusk, I'm watching a rabbit fuck around in the distance with the scope, before I get bored and look around in the distance with it. It's absolutely beautiful, the dark stone and brown sand contrasting with the bleached grey trees, the purple sunset, the white thing. Dude what? Swing the scope back to the white thing, which was previously perched, to my knowledge, on one of the stones in the distance. It's gone now, but I would have bet money on it. Pausing green text again for this preliminary description. I didn't really see it too well the first time, on the rock but it was crouched, either quadrupedal and standing, or bipedal and sitting with its arms and hands on the ground. It wasn't especially big at first, but that may have been the distance. Bleached white like a bone, not really much detail at the range I was in. Continue observing for the white thing, maybe it's a pale coyote or something else, but don't catch a glimpse of it. 
Based on where I saw it, it was maybe directly or slightly off kilter to our west. Ask dad if coyotes can be albino. Basically get a response of, yes you fucking retard aren't you in school. Shrug, call it an albino coyote and forget about it. Fast forward through some idiot shenanigans and conversation to true dark. Laying in tent, dogs inside with us. Can't. Also pick related, it's close to the grove, just add more trees. Suddenly the younger one goes berserk, a few seconds before the other one joins in. Making jerks between sides of the tent, which is relatively large to service three men and two dogs, just pacing around it, growling, barking, or tackles up, they look like monsters. I've never seen these dogs quite like this, it's full on defensive slash offensive posture. Genuinely thought they were going to attack US for a few seconds, before I got awake enough. The smell of garbage and sulfur is back, though faint. Dad wakes up, Nick and I can smell it, but he doesn't seem to be bothered, and we don't mention it, and neither does he. He might have smelled it, but who knows, I don't think he did at that point. Steps outside the tent, dogs run out in front of him the very millisecond the door unzips, and begin pacing the length of the tent and our little camp area. Dad puts their leashes on and says, well we may as well go now, didn't get as much of a nap as I wanted, but it's about midnight. Fucking dad and his fucking naps. The dogs are still on defend and destroy, red alert 9000 or some shit, looking around erratically, constantly pulling against the leashes. Finally my dad snaps at them to heal and shut up and they do so, albeit still grunting and growling. We all piss into the desert sands like men, and one of the dogs loosens his lizard too. Grab the headlamps and two flashlights and we're off, dad carrying a .22 pistol, Nick holding the other one, Nick moment, holy shit. This is so cool. Nick's parents never gave him guns, in hindsight it was probably autistic to give him one, but he's not a retarded guy and it's a fucking .22. I, of course, proudly bear the .22 rifle. We head north, it's a pretty simple walk back to the grove, dogs are still not pleased by this venture. Breaking green text to talk about my dogs a bit more, and my dad, myself, and Nick, physically. Max was slightly smaller of the two, and a few years older. He wasn't as quick on the draw, ever, but was still a very sturdy and reliable animal. He made you feel safe, but was generally more high-strung. Beaver was the larger and younger of the two, laid back, but was trained from puppyhood to be a god among animals. I'm about 5 feet 9 inches, was back then, too, and Nick was around 6. We were both fit from soccer. Dad's about 5 feet 11 inches and didn't age the best, but was still muscular. Everyone gets a potbelly. Max seems the most irritated, constantly breaking focus to bark once or twice before hushing on his own, and Beaver is a silent asshole, minding the leash but on tenterhooks of aggravation. We get to the grove and the garbage slash burn smell is about three times as bad as when we were there the first time. The dogs straight up refuse to go in. Like, they actually refuse, they dig their heels in and Max begins growling and staring, before lurching back and forth as if unsure if he wants to bum rush the grove or stay put. Dad sighs and looks around, we can't leave them on their own because it's the desert in the middle of the night, but Dad doesn't want us out here alone. Oh, we can run in on our own and check, you're only a few hundred feet away anyways. Okay son, don't be long, I'm gonna sit down and look for constellations. Not sure if worst dad or best dad, but he's my dad, so it counts for something. Those few hundred feet become very long when you're behind gnarled wood and rock formations, in a shadowy black world, and you turn around and all you see is a lone light from a headlamp. Nick and I, however, emboldened by our guns and teenage idiocy, pressed on through and towards the smell. Can't. Pick related, beaver. This time we really did make an effort to be quiet, almost crawling in the dark, our lights all off except one flashlight, which he held having only a one-handed gun. Behind the beginnings of the grove, however, that teenage strength began to fail me just a little. 
The putrid smell, the eerie darkness, and the lack of dad made me somewhat unnerved. By our low light we estimated we were maybe 20 feet away from the area of the den. We were correct. However, we had to creep around to the front, having approached it from the back. Breaking green text here. As we cleared the back side of the den and were in the front, we heard a crack from nearby as a very odd white creature fucking sprinted, almost too fast to notice in the low light, about 10 feet in front of us and into the den. If it wasn't for it being so white, the light might not have even caught it, and we might have played the crack off as an owl or other bird and been unaware that the den became occupied in front of our eyes. We did, however, both notice, and I kindly thank my dad for always preparing us with flashlights and other gear on journeys. The thing was rather tall, and not especially broad as it was long, but then, at first, we only caught the side view in low light. We froze, and here comes the part that haunted me for two years, almost every night, before it passed, and what has recently resurfaced. It all happened very quickly from here, and I'll try to not exaggerate details. Nick and I continued to get close, but this time, both of us had a round chambered and were pointing the guns at the den. We made our way until we were about five or six feet away from the entrance, and then flipped on our headlights. I don't know why we did that, I think it was our intent to startle it and be able to see it and then run. It was very startled, and let out a very disgusting, screeching growl bark. Like a short, hoof that most canines do, but very ugly sounding. It was also higher pitched, and sounded like there was spit and snot behind it. It was very apparent to us at that moment that this wasn't a coyote. We bounced back a few feet, and the creature didn't emerge. We could still see it, but it was moving around inside the den in a bit of a frenzy. It made the scream growls a few more times, and Nick and I unanimously began to yell to each other to fucking run, dude. That was probably the biggest mistake of the night, but thankfully, neither of us suffered for it. What we should have done was open fire the minute we realized it wasn't a coyote. The second we turned and ran, I could hear sand and bone rattling being tossed as it ran out after us. Nick squeezed off a few random shots, I think out of fear, and I managed to get up into a tree, about five or six feet in the air. Nick was right behind me, but instead chose the rock formation, about ten feet away. He played forward, after all, so his sprints were harder than mine, and I think he just wanted to run at that moment. The white creature pursued Nick, backing off whenever he turned, and then leaping along after he looked away. It was a dangerous game that only took a few seconds to play, but it unfolded in slow motion for me. Nick popped off the rest of the .22 clip, and then the white creature began to scale the rock. I wasted only a second more before leveling the rifle and firing blindly. I could have hit Nick. I'm glad I didn't. I did, however, scare the white thing, or at least attract it. It left Nick and then Bark screamed at me, leaping off the rock. I began shimmying up the tree, and in the darkness, I cracked my head against a branch sticking out directly over me. The mungo began to climb the tree below me. In a daze, my vision blurring a bit, I popped another two or three shots. The clip of the rifle only has six rounds, and I kept that in mind. I figured I only had two left, as I wasn't counting very well, and didn't want to be overconfident. Nick's yelling at something, maybe the white creature, but then I hear a different pitch of scream. Nick just fucking threw the gun at the white creature, and hit it. Not hard, but those metal bastards weigh a couple pounds, and later on I realized why it hurt. Again, this whole sequence took maybe 30 seconds, but it felt so much longer. Then, as the thing is looking to climb again, I see it go flying off of the tree trunk. Beaver, Max, and Dad came to the gunshots and yelling, my dad several seconds behind. Beaver has just ripped the mumble off of the tree by slamming into it and grabbing it. I'm unsure how many of you are dog people, but German Shepherds have very boxy, broad chests and shoulders. If they leap at you and their teeth miss, they'll still knock you flying a few feet if they intend to. In this moment, time seems to totally slow down. 
Even in the nightmares, this particular sequence plays out very, very slowly. Nick and Dad are yelling, Max and Beaver are snarling, yelping, and my contact vision is starting to clear. The headlamp clearly illuminates this thing as it tries to deal with the dogs. It stands up. It's not quadrupedal, it's bipedal, and for two or three seconds, I got a very clear image that's burned forever into my head. It's tall, maybe seven feet, and skinny as hell. I mean scrawny. Long forearms, long hind legs, all of it built like a dog. Somehow, even though it's so thin, I can't make out bones, but maybe it's the flashlighting and the white fur that's obscuring it. It's blisteringly white, stained now with red, either my dog's or its own blood. The neck is rather long, and it has a very long, pointed muzzle and face. No discernible ears or facial features. There's a gangly little tail, and its eyes and nose appear to be black, but I could be wrong on the eyes in the circumstance. It had teeth, but I couldn't tell you what kind. The forearm, paws, hands, whatever, had fairly long digits and there were short claws on the end. I less saw them and more heard them make contact with the dogs. Overall, the thing most resembled a whippet or a greyhound in how skinny and long it was, and the face. It was built like a canine, as well, but it definitely stumbled around on two legs to get the advantage on the dogs, for many, many seconds. It wasn't just rearing, it was balanced like that, and its back and chest were appropriate for it. It looked natural to see it on two legs, basically. Again, I'm unsure if you're familiar with German Shepherds, but when they bite, they bite hard. They're the third or fourth hardest biting dog in the world, pound for pound, if I remember correctly. When they bite down, they don't let go. Beaver, at least, had some great purchase on this thing's arm and I heard a loud crack and the most horrific bark scream released. Max was just snapping and ripping into whatever he could grab, I think. Dad didn't shoot, I don't think he wanted to hit the dogs, and I didn't either, so I didn't waste my shot. The dogs did good work, and I don't think this monster even wanted to fight, but we walked up on his house in the middle of asphalt nowhere. I hear a more normal yelp and Max's head gets drizzled in blood. The ugly thing flails and Beaver drops a few feet to the ground and as it had been swinging the dog a bit. It screamed again and then sprinted on its hind legs and I lost sight of it after it left the grove. This is where the nightmares ended, at least. Max's ear had a hole in it, towards the middle, and had likely been bitten. It bled a lot but was minor and he's had far worse. Beaver was unscathed. Thankfully, overall, none of us were really hurt. Blood was all over the clearing, and in both dogs' mouths. I crept down from the tree, and Nick got off the rock spire. I landed on a .22 handgun, where it had been thrown and knocked into the mongrel. Picked it up, shoved it in my pocket, and ran to my dad, too scared to cry. Nick was shell-shocked, as well. The dogs gave pursuit, but my dad called them back. None of us said anything, really. We walked back to the campsite. I don't remember ever putting the rifle down, and dad still had a fully loaded gun. The dogs were still aggravated, but seemed quieter, as if they believed the fight was over. We all stayed awake, sitting outside of the tent, my dad and I clutching guns, Nick just staring. Come dawn, we packed up and marched out, still not talking about it. When we got back into town, my dad looked at us in the back seat and said it was some kind of diseased coyote, and to not worry about it. We nodded, not really knowing anything else to say. None of us believed it. It was a short encounter, relatively, but we were all scared out of our minds, because that tall-ass white maggot wasn't a damn coyote. Nick and I neglected to really keep in touch once soccer season ended, and by then I had gotten a job, so I didn't sign up again. I tried to bring it up to Dad once, but he just shook his head and told me to stop thinking about it. We've never talked about it since. I've been out to the Badlands a few times since then, because I still love it, and my dad has too, having once been a part of search and rescue a few years ago. 
We've never seen anything, and though we don't mention it, we make a point to never go anywhere within 10 miles of the grove. I would really have loved to not ever think about this again, and for a few years, I haven't. I'm 20 now, and the last two-ish years, it's mostly faded from memory. But in the past week, the nightmares are resurfacing, likely because of stress from other things in my life, and I need to talk this out somewhere, so I put it here. So that concludes my story, slash x slash. If anyone has had a similar experience with that White House spawn, or has questions, I'll probably be awake another hour or so. Slash x slash move slow, and I'll be back in the thread tomorrow. Beaver's older, but is still healthy, and Max's ear healed fine. He's past elderly now, and missing most of his teeth, but both dogs made it out okay, for those concerned. So this story begins with me helping my grandmother by painting her house, due to the fact that this lady on a ladder would, at best, result in a broken hip, and at worst, a broken neck. I suppose she could have hired some professional painters, but she happened to live in bumfuck nowhere, the Dallas, Oregon, and our family has this annoying habit of staying poor, so hiring laborers would be too costly. Some more context, my whole family on my mother's side are Jehovah's Witnesses, or Jehobos, as I like to call them. I'm guessing this happened sometime after the family crossed the Atlantic. This has led to them becoming very strange, but nothing that would warrant serious intervention. For example, they are firm believers in the paranormal, and that invoking God's name can thwart off threats. All in all, after studying my family history, I decided this was a major improvement from our semi-nomadic, gypsy past, which had a tendency to give me the shivers thinking about the strange things that our ancestors did. Picked semi-related. It's the kind of bumfuckery you'd see in the Dallas. Arrive at my grandmother's house on a small lot of land in the middle of fucking nowhere. A few houses within eyesight, but the place is isolated. The only noise you heard aside from the noise you made was the neighbor's rooster in the morning. As soon as I get in the door she tries to sell me on this month's issue of The Watchtower, a church-issued magazine. Yeah, yeah, okay grandma, so what parts of the house am I painting? She had just moved into this new house, so she gave me a tour. The first thing I noticed was how basic it was. She wasn't at risk of freezing, but there were patches with no insulation. Instead of paint on many of the walls, there was this ancient, cheap wallpaper that was fading. The whole place gave me this run-down and cheap feel. One bit that weirded me out was how strangely the house was planned out, or how little of it was actually planned out. There were seemingly random doorways and chambers, which was a little unnerving considering that many of these rooms served little obvious purpose. The house was a medium size, which was large considering it was only housing my grandmother and her 12-year-old Shih Tzu. The creepiest thing about the place was all the abandoned shit everywhere. Books, clothes, rusty tools, kitchenware, children's toys, ECT. Apparently her inner jitsi kicked in and decided all this leftover, worthless trash was acceptable. That or she needed a cheap place and when the landowner said as is, they really meant as is. It becomes apparent that this trip to paint her house may extend a few days, so I can make her home somewhat respectable and habitable. Decide that I'll get started on the place first thing in the morning, seeing as I had arrived at about 8.30 and it was now nearly 10 p.m. So we eat dinner in the living room, and I get set up on the couch. About 30 minutes into trying to sleep, I'm ripped from my trance by the sound of footsteps down the hallway. Grandma. No response. I don't know what's going on, but I feel anxious, so I reach down to the floor and pull my pocket knife out of my shoe, as if that would be my lifeline. Something about this place just gives me bad vibes. While I'm thumbling around on the ground for my knife, I can hear some items being shuffled about in the impenetrable blackness down the hallway. I freeze. The fact that I can't see whatever this is causes me to get increasingly nervous, and I try to hold my breath. I know that if it starts coming towards me I'll be able to see it coming by the bluish-gray moonlight cast across the hallway in a slanted square shape. In the silence that follows, 
I can hear my grandmother snoring loudly down the hallway. Nothing happens for some time. Whatever it was didn't sound particularly threatening, just unexpected. As I attempt to go back to sleep, I can hear something softly pattering about in the attic, which starts to feel less threatening over time, and I eventually drift off. The next morning I ask my grandmother if she has a rodent problem, seeing as this house was anything but modern and critters could easily get in. No rats or raccoons, she says. That's interesting. We hear the crackling of her gravel driveway, and somebody in an 80s Chevy square body truck stops outside the house. It's the neighbor. He starts explaining how he heard some weird stuff last night, and he wanted to make sure that I was aware of the property lines. Apparently, I upset the balance of this place by causing more than 30 mammals to be occupying the same 1,000 square yards and now shit's getting funky. Weird, I haven't left the building since I got here. Well keep an eye out. Apparently the last person to live here was another old lady that died about 10 years ago. At this point, I'm not too worried about anything, so I got about my plan to start painting. This goes on without incident for about 6 hours until I start painting one of the purposeless rooms. The step ladder is facing a wall, and I'm on the top rung painting the corner in between the wall and the ceiling. I'm thinking about some sophomore slut and painting away when I hear something above me that makes my heart sink. It's the kind of sound that is made when somebody makes a single step or puts pressure on one foot on a creaky floorboard, a kind of slow, moaning creaking noise. I have a mini panic attack, ditch the brush and jump off the ladder with my hands up. Fucking rats. I get a little frustrated that I just shaved three months off of my life, after exercising my heart like that over a damned animal. I'm coming down and inspecting the room for anomalies, until I see that there is a trapdoor leading to the attic from this room. Okay. Grandma, could you come in here? Proceed to ask her about the attic and if she has started to store things in here yet, as my cousins move her in here. Really I'm just a gigantic pussy and wanted her to be there while I checked it out. What a surprise, more leftover shit up here. Also, other leftover shit in a form of animal feces, confirming my suspicions. She's bringing in boxes for me to lug up here, when I find something very strange. A ring of dead rose petals, some symbols written on the plywood, surrounding some dust slash ash and a plain wooden figurine. For some reason, this featureless literal stick figure gave me a strong feeling of dread. What? The. Fuck. I started to get this paranoid feeling that I didn't belong there, and that I needed to get the fuck out of there. Immediately start telling my grandmother what I found, standing 12 feet above her and speaking through the square hole in the ceiling. Her eyes double in size and she turns white. She starts shouting at me to grab the doll with her handkerchief and bring it downstairs immediately. I got to grab the doll, but the feeling of dread intensifies tenfold. I experience this surreal feeling of torment, in which time slows and I fearfully gaze at the doll before grabbing it. This whole event lasted 5 seconds, but it felt like a minute. I bring the figurine down and head towards the living room. The front door is open and my grandma has clearly entered psycho mode. In the middle of the driveway she's already made a small pile of firewood and lit it with some matches and some kerosene. She shrieks at me to hurry up and throw it in the blaze. We sat there watching it burn and I felt a huge catharsis. Like all my worries were alleviated and the threat was gone. As we watched it burn, I looked at the details of the figure. It had no facial features, and the thing was clearly handmade, you could see the chisel marks. About five minutes into just standing there watching this thing burn, we hear a loud bang. The front door had slammed shut and bounced open again, about 30 degrees ajar and creeping further. She invites me to come inside and pray with her. I don't fight her on this one. We come in and pray, and she does some sloppy but very serious blessings around the house. Decide to call it an early day, and we play cards, talk, eat dinner and go to bed. Seriously jolted by what I saw up there, but I'm able to keep cool. The night was the same as last night in the sense that right when I was about to get some sleep I awake to some quiet noises in the darkness. 
This time my heart is about to jump out of my chest, as I realize this is most likely not a fucking raccoon. I'm staring down the hallway again, looking past my feet, waiting for something to step out into the moonlight and reveal itself. I can fucking feel it creeping back there. As I start to breathe normally again, I can see something in the light. The most horrifying thing I have ever seen begins a kind of hurried walk towards me. The creature is 5 feet tall and humanoid, with long black hair, I cannot distinguish in features, its skin is as black as the void, aside from white glowing eyes. Before I can move it reaches me, staring me dead in the eyes inches from my face. I scream in terror, I honestly thought I might have just died of fright because I saw nothing. I realize that I was dreaming and that the hallway is completely black. It was a cloudy night. A hallway light is flicked on and my grandmother comes in to check on me. I'm speechless, but I can sense that she knows what happened. I decide to sleep on the floor in my grandmother's room that night like a child, but honestly I have never been more frightened by something I can't see in my entire life. The next few days nothing happened, although I never entered the attic again. My grandmother apparently had some felders come to her home and sanctify it, and she didn't mention anything else happening. She moved out of there about six months later, and I haven't been there since. The entity in question is something I have read about on Slash X about only twice. They all describe it the same way, short, black humanoid that moves quickly. I wish I knew what the fuck it was. To start, I apologize in advance for the length of this story and want to firmly make sure that I do not care if it is believed or not. If you cannot believe it I can only say I understand and wouldn't myself if I hadn't experienced it. This was three years ago. I was doing postgraduate study which concerned aboriginal communities. I was allowed a placement in the younger town of Ramanjaning in Arnhem Land, which is a tiny strip of halfway urbanized land that borders the huge fuck-off park which is rather kindly called a Rafira Swamp. The swamp is probably one of the most wild places in Australia. Imagine a country-sized swathe of perpetually decaying forest flooded in a stagnant foul-smelling water plain. And with crocs a real danger. My place was basically a shack and it was right at the edge of the swamp. It was technically not within the town limits and actually sat a good couple of miles away along a dirt road. It was an abandoned country house and I had it all to myself. The back had a veranda that looked out over the great black swamp, some very impressive views come dusk, and on either side it was enclosed in a dusty circle of eucalyptus. I knew literally no one out there and won't lie when I say it was pretty creepy those first weeks trying to acclimate to being more truly alone than I had ever been before, in this old rusty tin shed of a house halfway out of town in clearing at the edge of the swamp. But adaptiveness is a virtue and I soon found myself spending my spare time fixing up the place and even sowing seed out the front and chopping some littler trees down. I remember my pride as I felled a small tree for the first time, after hours of panting. When I went into town and sold off the wood I told the folk there it had taken a lot less time than it really did. They were all well accustomed to hard labor and it was quite a culture shock when I ate dinner at homes that didn't have a television, let alone a computer. The people did not all live in exactly what would be termed poverty as some places were wealthier than others in the typical sense and there was a real effort at maintaining a distance from some norms of outer society anyway. For example, there was, and remains, a ban on booze that was taken fairly seriously while I was there. So I was sober for a full year, although many hearing the story have suggested I was drunk or high. The first month or so was rocky but invigorating and really kept me going. As I've said I struggled a bit with the isolation and having to spend my time doing things I never would usually like tilling the soil and chopping timber wood, but it was good detox and after a while the smell of the swamp got less shit. At first the sounds of the different birds and nightlife damn near kept me up at night, but in time I learned to distinguish the birds and reptile noises and found comfort in them. On two occasions I was lucky enough to hear the booming voice of a croc near the house. It was real back to nature shit and by the second month I really got into the swing of it, and had adapted fully to having long periods of time alone with myself in the bush. 
It was some time this second month that it first happened, though at the time I thought nothing of it. I was sitting on the back veranda on a very warm, crisp afternoon. I was reading, I think, when after some time I became aware of a strange silence. I had to strain my ears for a while but soon I could confirm that there was only the sounds of a slight breeze, the soft movement of water and the creak of my rocking chair. The usually all-enveloping choir of birds, bugs and frogs had at some point subsided. As I registered this sudden silence a feeling like no other crawled down me and I actually physically shuddered. It was like my bones were briefly frosted and I was washed over with an internal coldness and a tingle throughout my skin. I became very dizzy and thought I might vomit so I stood up and in a second that I put my head it happened and was over before I could register what I had seen. It's impossible to describe how I must be perceived at the time. All I can say is that I saw a nearby tree, a long thin white spear that stood some distance back from and beneath a couple bigger ones. This tree was like many others, it had shed its branches, leaving just the thin trunk standing upright. What I saw was this tree twitching rapidly, like it was having a fucking seizure, before wriggling into place and going still again. No other tree nearby did the same. I doubted my own eyes. Dizziness forgotten. I stared at it for a long time, not terribly scared but not particularly comfortable either. I could not tell what I had seen and whether or not it was a side effect of head rush or not. The tree just stood there, still as ever and I noticed the bird song had come back and warmth returned to my body and I forgot about it for a long time. I had gotten in with a school teacher in the area and now spent three weekdays getting to talk to kids at the education center, so I was spending less daylight hours at the house. On those swampy dusks I would tend to sit on the veranda and have a quiet smoke, maybe read until night came. As summer was turning into whatever season came next, the cycle was not very pronounced in that region, which remains very humid most of the year, I noticed an increase in insects. I don't mind bugs, but I think everything is slightly creeped out by those long-legged flying, crane flies, but which in that area were called daddy long legs. I remember sitting at the veranda and seeing for the first time a great swarm of the things, maybe just hatched, forming great clouds against the orangey light of the sky. The cranifleas in that swamp got so fucking big you could hear them rustling against each other, and that is no exaggeration. These things could be meters away, and you would hear the vibration sound of their wings. As I say I'm not too afraid of bugs, but when I went to take a piss in the middle of the night, the toilet was bit of an outhouse, and find myself in a crabbed space with a gull-sized crane fly buzzing around the light, occasionally bumping into me and feeling my body with its long horrible legs I was a tad on edge. The other bug which began to cause me some anxiety was a kind of mollusk like a barnacle which would appear in clumps on the water edge after it had been raining. These things weren't particularly creepy, but they worried me because they grow rapidly and would often spread to the steps on the veranda. I asked a local fisherman how to remove them and he went into his truck and returned with a metal paint scraper. So I added the job of scraping these little barnacle things off the old wooden steps. It was not fun experiencing their reddish interior bodies, the way they peeled off like a hard-shelled scab and the truly noxious smell. Aside from the growing presence of the insects inside and around the house I was keeping well. I kept clearing the area of wheat plants and chopping down little trees to sell in the town. As well as insects the seasonal change had brought a tide of litter in the water, which I was told happened every year. More and more clumps of old plastics and bottles and shit was accumulating in a line of detritus outside the house. I started picking it up in the mornings, keeping the water clean while I was there. It was as I did this one morning that for whatever reason I chose to look directly up at that old white tree I briefly freaked out over and saw it was not there. At first more confused than frightened I paced the water line, convinced I had mistaken where it was placed. But no, there was no mistake. Everything about the area looked as it always had, clear in my mind from many evenings of study. All but that little tree, where now there was just a bare spot of land. I had no time to think of it, but as I spent the day teaching I more and more dreaded the return home. I even tried to arrange for a couple of friends I'd made to come over that night, but they insisted on postponing till the weekend. 
So I drove home alone that night and when I got back it was full dark. The evening calls of the owls and swamp birds gave me little comfort. I couldn't shake the image of that shivering tree. I had no reason to think anything of it, nor what it might mean but the image, like a horrible glitch in reality, pestered me no matter how much I tried to distract myself. I'll never forget that night as I lay wide awake in the dark hearing outside my window this sound, this slow drawn out creak and cracking noise. I'd heard it before, one sound of the forest out of many, but on this night it pierced my frayed nerves. I lay there a long time listening to it. It sounded like some kind of rickety pole was swaying barely inches from my window. I was too shit scared cowardly to look out the window so I examined the patch of moonlight it cast on the floor. I could see so many moving things, the limbs of the trees in the wind, that it was impossible to make out anything. Then, with total clarity, I heard this dreadful noise. Tap. 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 Against the glass. There was no mishearing it, no denying it. As plain as day, there was something tapping the glass just above my head. There was no tree growing near the window, nor even a bush or anything else for that matter. I frantically tried to think up contrived reasons. Maybe the guttering had fallen loose and was tapping the glass in the wind, or it was one of those cranifleys hitting the glass. But I couldn't bring myself to look and lay there, rigid, pretending to be asleep. I waited like this for about 20 minutes before the noise faded. It took me a while to work up the nerve to look out but of course when I did there was nothing there. After a while it was easier to convince myself that it actually had been something normal, that it was just a minor thing and I got to sleep. The next day was particularly bright. It was that kind of heat which is thick and palpable in the air which is saying something given the usual weather. In a way my memory of the day, revisited so many times is saturated in heat, like a photo gets dimmed over time left in the light. When I first got up it was just another day. The events of the previous night and the odd tree were forgotten as I went through the automatic morning rituals. It hadn't got really hot yet and everything was nicely lit. The view of the swamp was gorgeous, the sun behind the canopy seemed to frost every leaf with gold. There was an upswell of bird noise and I saw a couple of wading birds out for frogs or lizards, anticipating the heat of the day. I worked a lot on my study in the morning. After a few too many coffees I came down with that overstimulated restlessness and couldn't focus on work anymore, continuously looking out the window and finding chores to do. The view out the window was especially appealing. The caffeine and the brightness projected everything in rich detail. Seeing some rubbish on the shoreline I convinced myself to dredge it out. So, happily I went down to the water and mucked about the little islands and rivulets picking up the junk that had floated in overnight, or maybe some had just been bobbing there a long time before I came, it was hard to tell, stacking it up into a little pile of gunk. This is when some strange things happened, in one moment. I noticed a bound book, half buried at a detritus bank around a shoreline. Consciously I picked it out of the rest, having a feeling about it. So I crack it open, it's a bit encased in mud, and opened up a couple of pages. It was the annual collected issues of a business journal. There were lots of different issues with covers and stuff. It seemed business oriented. At the back, however, was a list of the year's grants. That included scholarships for university work. Scrolling the list of scholarship grants, I saw my, in plain delight, my name. I haven't told this story to many people but whenever I do they seemed unimpressed by this fact. Of course it was there, I did have a scholarship and it was a business journal with a list of scholarship grants. I know when I'm not saying it was paranormal necessarily. But understand how weird it felt to be the furthest you've ever been from home, pick a random book out of the water and see your own name in it. Regardless of how stupid it was I fucking shivered. I closed the book and put it in the junk pile. Then I stood to get up and saw a man standing on the other side of the stream watching me. Already a little unsettled I nearly fucking shat myself when I saw him. It wasn't just that I hadn't seen a single other person on the property since I'd been there, it wasn't just that he was standing there, silently, look at me, he was also standing half behind the trunk of a tree, 
so I could only see one arm and a leg and one half of his face. But he wasn't hidden at all and couldn't have been trying to be. He was just standing halfway behind a tree. His shirt and pants were a browny gray and pretty faded into the background, but his face and limbs were white and stood out in contrast. Before I have time to collect myself I see his one arm waving at me, in a friendly gesture not in a threatening way at all. I wave back and then stand there not knowing what to do because he doesn't fucking make a movement he just stays exactly where he is, looking at me. There's no way I'm approaching this guy so I just wave again, kind of vaguely pointing towards my house to indicate him going inside or something. He waves back but still doesn't move. So I head back to the house, trying to carefully to maintain a steady pace, for some reason not wanting to walk too fast to give away how rattled I was. Once I dared look over my shoulder, and caught sight of his leg, turned back and going into the forest. Slightly relieved, I went back home and locked the doors. I wanted to latch the windows even but the heat contained in the house was already great enough with them open. The wallpaper glue was visible on the walls like sweat. The isolated events now weighed on me heavily. While previously none of these weird incidents had overwhelmed my experience I was now unable to stop my heart racing, stop scaring myself with thoughts of that fucking man standing behind that fucking tree. With great difficulty I calmed myself enough to decide that heading into town was the best option. Not trusting the security of the place I decided I would bring my laptop and shit. So I'm sitting at the table, brooding over my breakfast bowl and I become aware of a disturbance of light on my right hand side. I turn and holy fuck there is face right there. I swore aloud and stood up, nerves on the edge of actually fucking splitting. The face leans back and I see two arms raised. It's a man, his shirt and whiteness making me instantly aware it's the creep from the swamp. I hear him say, sorry didn't mean to scare ya, or something like that and say he didn't know the place was occupied, that he saw me down on the swamp and was intrigued by a stranger to the place. He asked to come. In. I said yes, what else could I do, and went to open the front door for him. For a moment he stood on the doorstep, then smiled and gave me his hand to shake and said thanks and nice to meet you and such, then he. Came in. Up close the guy looked pretty old. He was encrusted in a tan but clearly white and his skin looked pretty cracked up and wrinkled in places. His face had a spooky quality even though it wasn't particularly fucked up it's hard to explain. It wasn't a major difference or anything but his face and especially his expression just seemed a bit younger somehow than the rest of him. I was probably. I just dazed off the heat and the day's events but this has always stayed in my memory how his face was just a little off. It was sort of awkward me walking pointlessly into the kitchen and him standing in the doorway between it and the hall smiling but not talking. I asked if he wanted coffee and he said sure and sat down, then asked about me and what a whitey was doing out in the swamps. I told him about my studies in such, vaguely, tentative to say too much to this weird smiling old guy. But as it turned out he didn't seem to be remotely interested in me at all, he just smiled docile and as soon as I stopped talking started telling me about himself, without any indication of hearing what I just said. I put down the coffees and sat myself at the table as he carried on excitedly. He would sometimes get ahead of himself and just end a sentence with a jumble of gibberish words in this thick Bushman accent. He didn't seem immediately threatening but I definitely did not feel he was of his right mind. He said he lived up north but lived off the land in the swamp most of the time. For a long time he just spoke of tilling the soil and catching his own food living in huts and shit but then he awkwardly cracked out a peal of laughter and asked loudly, do you got a girl here? I was pretty taken aback but before I could answer his smile completely flipped and he asked, suddenly stern, almost angry, is there a girl here mate? I shook my head but now the atmosphere had changed completely. He was gripping the table hard. And then just as quickly as it came on this moment passed and he continued as if nothing happened. It was the most schizo thing I'd ever seen. I can't remember what he said after that but eventually he showed himself out, coffee left untouched, and after walking a while down to the swamp looked back at me and said, as if touching on a shared joke, 
Couldn't keep a girl safe here anywhere with all them bloody warrigals, and walked off. Warrigals was the word used to describe Aboriginal people in like the 1800s. Fairly creeped out I locked up and took my gear and the car out to town. The heat wasn't letting up and the car ride is in my mind a bit of a haze. Outside the school I saw another teacher packing her things into her own car. She waved and I pulled up beside her. I must have looked shaken because she asked what was the matter with me. I told her about the weird man, to which she grinned knowingly and said, did he scare you? She said he was mischievous but harmless. I remember her words, he'll fuck with you but he doesn't hurt a fly, if it is him. She said he wasn't often seen. It was as if she were talking about a folk tale more than a real man. Apparently this man had lived near the area about 9 or 10 years ago. As recently as that he had been a regular visitor to the town and a well-liked guy. She had been much younger then but remembered that he would drive through town and sell veggies and homemade jam that he was fondly regarded by most. His wife was typically with him. She described them as the sweet old couple. The two were regarded highly enough that when his wife passed away she was buried near the grounds and some friends from the town helped do the funeral. The guy was obviously distraught and seemed completely shell-shocked for a long time after it happened. His trips into town got less and less regular. His demeanor seemed subtly changed, still jolly but in a different, stranger way. His behavior was increasingly odd. Everyone understood his pain following the death of his only real close company, so when he referred to her in passing, her daily doings, as if she wasn't dead there was mostly just sympathy, as well as the expectation that with some support he would get back to his old self. But things were only downhill from there. There were uncomfortable encounters where he asked people if they'd seen her around, to which there could be no easy response. The discomfort was not lessened when he started showing up disoriented, crying, telling people his wife had gone missing and that a search party needed to be formed immediately. Things came to a head when someone refused to dance around the issue and simply told him the fact of the matter. His wife was dead, buried not far out of town. By all accounts the man's response had been shocking though not as unhinged as perhaps expected. He sort of sadly accepted what he'd been told and wasn't seen around town for a while. But when next he came back his behavior was only more fucked. He announced that he didn't trust a single fucking warrigal and that he knew they'd done something with his wife. After some drunken spiels against warrigals and anger at their having stolen his wife, keeping her captive somewhere. He was strongly dissuaded by some local leaders from coming to the town as he had used to and seemed to understand because he wasn't seen in the town again. Word spread from some northern boys that he'd been seen drunk as a fish, telling anyone who would listen the swamp warrigals that tormented his wife in her final days, driving her mad with their mischief and how he hadn't believed her until it was too late. He was now fully convinced that a tribe had taken her away and were holding her captive somewhere in the swamp. It also emerged that he had lost his house and his car, but he was still seen from time to time at the outskirts of the swamp, hunting, eventually he wasn't even a regular at any bars and as the years passed faded into a half-mythical figure, the mad old man of the swamp. Yet he was real. Sometimes hunting parties from the town would see him, even trade with him despite his now full-fledged hostility towards any and all warrigals he met. So this was the story she told me. She stressed, as I will hear, that she couldn't confirm any of this, having only memories of the man's happy years and having not seen him since. Some of the tale probably was just the garnishing of legend. But that he was out in the swamp for long periods at a time was certain. And the hunting parties which came across him always reported that he was convinced of his wife's continued existence as a captive to some unknown tribe somewhere in the swamp. Now this tale left me feeling overwhelmed, exhausted but nonetheless a bit relieved. The frightfulness of this man was cut down a fair bit by the patheticness of his story and I felt a bit sorry for him. But I didn't want to go home for a while and spent some time alone in the town before heading back out. I got home just past dusk, when there was still a faint light about things. But as I tentatively looked around the house half expecting something to pop out and spot me I was aware of a greater darkness than usual. 
It took me a while but I investigated the windows and found that on those facing the swamp there was a growing layer of those fucking barnacle looking mollusks. It's hard to describe what it was like seeing a cluster of these cramped up on the glass, but if you've seen the inside of a rock cleaner, the fleshy part under the shell, you've got a good idea. I almost gagged. I didn't much want to, but I worked up the nerve to go out and scrape them off. Well, the whole bottom part of the wall was practically packed with them. A lot had been there a long time or maybe had dried up and hardened in the sun because scraping them off was like pulling teeth and when they finally fell down they took a wee bit of splintered wood with them. Darkness settled and I was still going, working by the indoor lights and my torch. It was only once I'd finished, leaving a sickly smelling pile of the things at the base of the wall, piles of husks I couldn't be bothered to do. Anything with that I realized how late was and the deep silence that permeated everything. Little sounds were painfully heightened, enhanced by my frayed nerves, like the tiny drops of water somewhere nearby as a bird or a fish or something moved about, and the slight rustling of leaves on a mostly still night. I had the feeling of being watched. Now I was well aware that was just my mind playing tricks on me, but after the day's events couldn't be fucked putting up with this mischievous old cunt, so I quickly shone the torch across the tree line, fast enough to catch him if he tried to run away. But there was nothing. So I dragged the light along the bank slowly, scanning carefully for any signs of movement. Every sound I heard was him fucking with me, and I shook a little. Then, as my grip steadied a little I saw it, a cluster of dead vines, or a tree maybe, half slumped half wrapped around the base of a big old conifer. For whatever reason I couldn't help but focus on it, something about it seems distinctly out of place. I remember I'd had a long time to get to know the panorama of the swamp and something uncertain struck me about this white clump. Then, in one horrible movement, it pulled back and went behind the tree. For a moment I could do nothing, paralyzed by fear when the silence was broken by a loud series of creaking, cracking sounds, and I knew something large was moving through the bush. I wasted no time bolting indoors and you can imagine the sleepless night I spent there, down near pissing myself every time I heard an owl or the house creak. The smell of those fucking barnacles had permeated the house, the smell alone, like sulfur, could have kept me up. The tapping from my room resonated into the living room where I huddled on the floor like a paranoiac. Somehow the crane flies were getting in, and now and again one would land near me and I'd have to crush it. I remember hearing a sort of clicking sound and looking up to see my ceiling coated in the fucking things. As I looked at their black mass of bodies the tapping seemed to register my pulse, getting louder and faster. I was sweating profusely, scared to look at the windows, trying to ignore the heat and the bugs and the tapping until it was too much and I switched on the television, an old set that still had rabbit ears and picked up barely the glitchiest signal but at least it drowned out the tapping. The screen just showed static and the vaguest forms of what looked like an infomercial or something but the sound quality was perfect when I heard, within seconds of switching it on, annual scholarship grant has been awarded to a non-anonymous, who will be doing field work up in Einhem. Congratulations Anon. The words just registered dimly and I couldn't be fucked anymore, so I just left the set on and the sound worked for a couple more names before giving out and giving way to a soft static which I turned up to full volume. The tapping noted this and got louder, beating like a metronome. At this stage I was almost laughing. I felt a bit delirious and couldn't get a grasp on if this was really happening or not. Then a different sound beat down the corridor, a hard loud knock, at the front door. I waited in terrified stillness. There came another knock. And then a voice. Hey Anan, you home? The voice was familiar. My friends from the town, I'd forgotten they were coming over on the weekend. Hey Anan, we're meant to be hanging out remember? But why was he over at 3am? Come on man, I can see you through the window. I looked up at the big windows but could see the dark night outside, maybe I could see some vague thing. My friend waving. Or just trees brushing against each other, or bugs at the window, it was impossible to tell. The thought of letting another person in made me realize the state I was in, the number of bugs on the walls and the ceiling and that god-awful smell. I shouted out that I was going to let them just be a minute. 
No response. As I scaled the corridor, I noted I couldn't hear the tapping anymore. I flicked on the outdoor light but couldn't make out a thing through the dappled glass window on the door. I took the handle and cranked open the big front door then looked out onto an empty deck and the barren front section. I called out if he was out there or not. The f from behind me I hear the reply, the other door, Anon. What the fuck, I think, I definitely heard him calling out from the front. But at this stage I can't be sure in my own senses, so I just call out that he shouldn't be a lazy cunt and should just come around the front. A long pause, as I stand at the open door, then, come on Anon, don't be a lazy cunt come around and open the door. At this stage I feel barely awake, hardly registering my steps as I move back down the corridor. As I near the side of the house where I scraped off all the barnacles the rank smell increases steadily and I approach the back door and look through the window to see if there's anyone there. For a moment I see nothing, just the bare swamp on all sides, then I turn to look onto the side of the door and see looking back at me a face so fucking horrible I don't like to even think of it today. The only thing I can compare it to is pick related. I fucking scream and fall back, and it fucking bolts it. The shock left me dizzy and I thought I would vomit. The smell reeling together whatever sanity I had left I knew I had to board up the windows, lock the door and wear out the night. As I regained my senses I had to hold onto the wall, grab onto things to pull myself up onto two legs. Once I did, I was still wobbling on my ankles, like seasickness when I heard the unmistakable scatter of parts across the kitchen floor. I turned and realized I'd left the front door wide open.